I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been looking at on extracting training data from diffusion models. Um, this is joint work with a whole bunch of my colleagues, and the paper really wouldn't have happened without uh, all of their help, and so I'd like to thank them for that. Um, so diffusion models are a new kind of neural network that's sort of emerged in the last couple of years, um, but you really may have seen them a lot over the last year for all of these high quality image generators that you have probably seen. If you've seen any of these like fancy images in the last six months or a year, it's probably been generated by a diffusion model. And the thing that really sets them apart is the fact that they're really, really high quality. When previous neural network generators could produce like fairly good images in controlled settings, these diffusion models can produce high quality images of astronauts riding horses in space or corgis in Times Square in a shopping cart wearing sunglasses and a hat. So like these, these diffusion models are really, really good. Um, and what's also really nice is it's relatively easy to use them. Uh, basically, all you have to do is you feed into them some noise, this is a sample from a Gaussian, and a text description of what you want. And for the purpose of this talk, it really doesn't matter how they work. This goes into a black box, and out comes a very high quality image. Training them is fairly complicated, but like we're not going to worry about that. OK. So why are we interested in diffusion models in a machine learning, not, like not in a machine learning conference, but at a security conference? The thing I'm interested in is these kinds of neural networks are being deployed in all kinds of sensitive domains. So we have machine learning models being trained on medical images. We have diffusion models in particular being trained on medical images. And so the concern is that if you train these kinds of models on sensitive records, you really want to make sure that you don't accidentally leak the training data the model was trained on if you publish the model. You don't want to go and publish a model trained on patient data and then accidentally discover that you've revealed patient data to anyone who has access to the model. And so this sort of brings up the question that we study in this paper, do diffusion models memorize their training data sets? And some people in the literature have had very strong claims that they do not. Um, so, sort of, for example, there's this one quote in the middle by some anonymous authors who said, at what point does one have to accept that reproducing specific images is impossible? Um, they said this after knowing that language models memorize all kinds of aspects of their training data set, but still they felt very, very confident that something was fundamentally different about the fusion models. And so what we'd like to do in our paper is try and basically answer this question. Um, so we're going to do that with an extraction attack that directly is going to recover individual examples from the training data set. OK, so um, this attack is going to be fairly straightforward. We're basically going to directly follow a previous attack that we had on language models and just apply it to the case of diffusion models. So in particular, what we're going to do is a two-step attack, where first we're going to generate a bunch of images, and then we're going to um, run a membership infant attack to separate the novel generations with the actual memorized data using a membership infant attack. OK, so how does this actually work? What we're going to do is just use the diffusion model in the completely intended way to generate a bunch of images. This is like, this is easy, right? This is what the models were built to do. You just, we pick random prompts, we ask the model for like a couple hundred images of that prompt, and we get a nice diverse grid of images. And now what we need to do is somehow find some way to separate the memorized images from the novel generations. And it might seem like membership inference is hard. Like, how are you going to sort of predict, given this set, which one of these are memorized and which ones aren't. And the reason that it's actually not that hard is that, in principle, you could try and do something really fancy. You could try and like, look for like, the weird signals and the images that might indicate if what you get out is memorized or not. But while that might be possible, we don't really even need to do that. Because it turns out that if you prompt the model for some prompts, you get a set of images that look like this. And if I sort of like mask out the ones that aren't memorized, you'll find that I asked the model here for a picture of George R. R. Martin, and it has given me like two thirds of the prompts here are like the exact same image. And so in principle, like, you know, it's possible that the model has just decided, sort of by its own accord, that when you ask for an image of George R. R. Martin, it should return an image with his hands in this very particular pose, wearing this hat with the same color shirt, looking the exact same way. Or it's possible this was just a training image the model decided to re repeat. I think that's far more likely. Um, and in fact, here, like, you find that you, not only do you get these memorized training images, you also get a different set of memorized training images. And so here, for one prompt, you can get two different kinds of memorized training images. 
And so what the attack that we have is very, very simple. We just make the simple observation that if you prompt the model for something many times, and you sort of form a graph where you put edges every time two images look essentially the same, and you look for dense subgraphs, sort of cliques in this, in this space, then what you find is mostly memorized training images. Okay. So what are we gonna actually do for, for measuring the effectiveness of this attack? We're going to study the stable diffusion model. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why we study stable diffusion. This is just one of the generators. Um, but the main three reasons is that it's one of the state-of-the-art models. It's like a really high-quality model at generating these kinds of images. The images that I've shown you earlier were generated by, was the images like of, the, of George R. R. Martin and the flowers were generated by stable diffusion. And so it's, it's very good at generating these high-quality images. But also, the model is completely open source. Um, this makes it nice for reproducibility. Anyone can run this model. And also from like a perspective of if we are to succeed, it's not the fact that like only we had special access, like anyone could have also succeeded in this way. And the final reason is that the data set the model was trained on is also public. Anyone can go access it. And so even if we succeed at extracting training data, we're not going to actually violate privacy of any individual person because like you could just have downloaded the data set and looked at the images yourself. Like it's not the case that you can only find the images by looking at the diffusion model. It would be far easier to just download the data set. But this also lets us check if our attack actually worked because once we run the attack, we can just go download the data set and check. And it's gonna be a little expensive. The data set is like a couple hundred million images. So we have to do this big giant set intersection. But like, you know, that's just a little bit of compute that we can handle. Okay, so we run our attack and we extract roughly 109 images from the training data set. Um, what do these images look like? Uh, we have a very diverse set of images and they sort of span the range of all the kinds of images you might wanna see. We get lots of images of people, sort of singers, actors, um, you know, we get some logos and like all the like different sort of album covers. We get all kinds of interesting things out of the model. And I think one interesting observation is that in many cases, the L2 distance between the image and the generated image, like the, the training image and the generated image, is closer than the L2 distance between the original image and a JPEG compressed version of that image. So like we have like almost pixel perfect reconstruction in many of these cases. In some cases there's some noise, but in lots of cases like it's a very, very high quality reconstruction. Okay. Um, so we have some plots in the paper that evaluate like how well this actually works in practice, looking at precision and recall. Uh, so for example, here what we have is on the x-axis the number of examples that we extract, and on the y-axis the precision of our attack. We generated roughly a couple million images, and so the baseline precision is like one in a million, but we find that we can memorize, or we can find the first 60 memorized images with perfect precision. So our membership from this attack is really, really good. If you want to find all 100 memorized images, the precision drops down to roughly 70%. But yeah, 70% far better than one in a million. Um, the main cause of memorization looks like it is repeated training data. Um, if you sort of count the number of times that the images that we extract are repeated in the data set, most of them are repeated a couple hundred times. Um, but it's sort of, we still don't fully understand this because there are actually a lot more images than this that are repeated like thousands of times that aren't memorized. And there are some images that we can extract that are repeated only a handful of times. And so we don't actually understand why some images that are repeated a thousand times are not in the data set, or not like memorized, but some images that are repeated a handful of times are. Maybe there's sort of some better similarity metric here, we're using some fairly simple one. And so you can imagine that some more work has to be done here. Okay. So we're gonna, I'll end with some sort of small controlled experiments um, because we have a bunch of them in the paper. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look there for all kinds of details around other membership inference results and looking at in-painting attacks and trying to understand how this works on CIFAR 10. We train a bunch of models we can control the outcomes for. We look at all kinds of sort of detailed results that are, are interesting. I encourage you to look at the paper for those. But let me sort of pull out one high-level result that I think is interesting to compare against, which is a comparison to GANs because GANs are the previous state of the art for image generation, and I think it's interesting to see how well these compare. And what's nice is that our attack, while it works on diffusion models, is actually completely agnostic to the type of images that you generate. And so we can just run this attack almost exactly as it is on GANs. And this actually gives us one of the first extraction attacks on GANs as well. Um, and what we find is that GANs are far more privacy preserving than diffusion models. If you sort of compare the least private GAN to the most private diffusion model, it's still the diffusion models are less private. And even more interestingly, if you sort them by how accurate they are, a lower FID means higher accuracy, it's a better quality image, 
we find that across both GANs and diffusion models, the better the image is, like the more accurate the model is in, in, in performing this task, the higher the membership, the higher the, the extraction attack success rate. Okay. So this is really all that I wanted to be able to talk about today. Um, let me end with a brief conclusion, which is just to say that diffusion models do not preserve the privacy of their training data. Um, on average, they're pretty okay. Like on average, most generations from a diffusion model are not training data. And so it's not the case that these models are just repeating images from the training data set. But in the worst case, they really can emit verbatim images from the training data set. And the reason why this matters for privacy is because privacy is not an average case metric. Like I can't say like, you know, sorry, like I lost all of your data. It's okay though, everyone else in this room, your medical images were not leaked. I only leaked that person's medical data. That's not something we can say in privacy. And so we really have to be careful when we deploy these kinds of models and settings where we actually need to preserve the privacy of training data. So with that, thank you and I'll take any questions.